Hi everybody, I'm PBA Hall of Famer Randy Peterson and I'm standing in front of Storm Headquarters here in Brigham City, Utah. Today we're going to be talking about the most technically advanced bowling ball our company has ever created. You know at Storm we know that you can't rush success. There are no shortcuts and that's why this new bowling ball was seven years in the making. So come with me as we take an in-depth look into a true modern masterpiece. It's time for the world to be introduced to the crux. Bowling is a very interesting sport in the fact that there's a couple different elements that you don't necessarily see in other sports. With bowling, we have a, an environment, a, a physical lane condition. Every time the ball travels down the lane, that environment changes a little bit. It, it changes faster than grass growing. Um, and so you have to be paying attention to what you're doing. You have to be thinking all the time when you're bowling. Imagine in a, in a football game, if it starts raining, if they had to change the football and make it a little bit heavier so it still travels through the air the same. Or if it was a baseball pitcher and they had to change the ball that they're pitching because of, of the rain, you know, affecting the curve. In bowling, this actually happened. It's as much a physical game as it is a mental game because you have to match yourself up to it. You have to figure out how does my physical game match these lane conditions and the way I'm releasing the ball. So as R&D teams work at this, we are constantly trying to keep up with that and provide our bowlers, the people that love this sport, we're trying to give them the opportunity to score and maintain their game so that they can focus on their physical release on those characteristics. When we're studying a bowler and we're watching their physical release, we're trying to learn about what changes. What we found is that through studying the sport, we saw sometimes a bowler, because of their shoulder movement or their feet changes, they might accidentally thumb it down a little bit and kind of top it. Now the ball hooks too much. So these are common mistakes that we see bowlers create from shot to shot, but when a bowler's matched up, they strike. What we found out is that each bowling ball has unique RG planes. They're a little bit longer, smaller, tighter, more elliptical. They all have a path. They all have a topographical layout to them. And what we found is that certain paths create certain motion. That's where some layouts have the tendency to go long and skid really hard and snap really hard at the back, and others are more arcing and consistent. It's related to these RG paths. So by studying them and anticipating what they're going to be, it's actually given us the opportunity to reverse engineer a bowling ball to try and create what we feel are optimal migration paths. The inspiration behind these RG planes and migration path, it's been a concept or idea that we've thought about uh, quite a long time in the industry. Uh, earlier designs uh, from our company here, we've, we've always kind of known about this, but we've never been able to quantify it or answer the why. I distinctly remember driving through the mountains one day, I was just contemplating how can we manipulate these shapes? What is it that we can do on the internal part of the components of the bowling ball that can really give us these unique contours? I started thinking about it and I started rotating objects in my head. So I came up with a, a nice small sphere. I took it and I elongated it into an oval. So by taking it and rounding one side of it, I created more of an egg type shape. This egg shape is is much more stable. It gives us good pin, good top weight. It gives us a lot of drilling options. But that alone isn't enough. So that's where driving through the mountains, all of a sudden, it came to me. They didn't drill through the mountain. They followed the mountains. They cut off sides of it. And that's where instead of drilling the cavity through it, we were able to take this contour and cut it upwards. And that cutting motion upwards, now all of a sudden, you see these elliptical planes and they get much more elongated. This creates consistency for us because now all of a sudden slight variations in release are still going the exact same direction. Maybe a little up, a little bit down, but it's still migrating in the same general path. What's unique about the double cavity design is this 60 degree wedge that creates these long ellipses that we really like. It creates a large cavity in the center of the ball where you typically see your thumb hole. So be it a pin up layout, a pin down layout, or even like a stacked layout, any one of these orientations, you're still within this cavity. And that means that the weight block, the heaviest, most densest part of the weight block remains unchanged. So these RG planes that we've worked very hard to manipulate and create are no longer being changed by your, your thumb hole. So this is a great thing for us because we know that no matter what layout you choose, no matter what layout uh, your pro shop professional operator wants to use, you are able to get a shape 
that isn't being changed by drilling. It's a great thing for us. Well, folks, as you can see from the video, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into the creation of the new Crux. Now, for more, let's send it downstairs to the hosts of this webinar, Hank Boomershine and Victor Marion. Thanks, Randy, here at the Storm Test Facility. Uh, Hank Boomershine here, Vice President of Sales for Storm Products. And to my right, the brainchild behind the Crux, Victor Marion. Hank, I got to tell you, I'm really excited today. This Crux there's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that we've put into this. And I don't only mean the R&D and the development of it, but bringing all the footage and showing all the neat and exciting things that we're doing. Uh, this ball, wow, that's all I've got to say. For today's presentation, uh, you want to give a little, little bit of details about it? Sure, Vic. Hey, webcast, first time we've done this in, in, you know, for ourselves. There's been a few other webcasts done in the industry, but not like this. Introducing some brand new technology to you today. Some great videos, some great uh, advancements in technology with us explaining the cover stock some really good stuff some great visual aids that we're gonna see today and you know throughout this uh, webcast you're gonna have the opportunity as the pro shops to reach out to ask questions because we know that when, when we introduce new technology sometimes pro shops struggle a little bit with kind of understanding so there is a live chat open so you can reach out to us there's some tech answering these questions as we go through it but you know what if at the end of the day you're uh, want to just sit and watch and at the end, you know, write your questions down. You can always send those in to us at tech at stormbowling.com. So a very dynamic presentation. I hope you all enjoy it. Can't thank you enough for tuning in today. So we've got a few other things to talk about. I've got to tell you, we, we did something a little bit different. When we're talking about explaining ball motion, one of the norms is to do a, a ball review video, right? You get to see the ball. You get to see a really good bowler throw it down the lane. You get to see shot after shot. But sometimes that bowler, as exceptional as they are, they don't always relate to your game. Or sometimes the lane conditions they're on aren't what you bowl on at home. Surface matters as well. Layouts. So what we decided to do is a little bit different for a ball reaction video. What we did, did is we took three professional bowlers and we took three amateur bowlers. We gave them two balls each, had them choose their favorite layouts, did some surface adjustments on it, and we put them on three different types of patterns. So to explain who these bowlers are, I'm going to send it off to Randy and Mike Flanagan. Welcome to Lake Wales, Florida, here at the Kegel Training Center for a very special amateur versus the pros challenge match featuring Storm's newest premier line bowling ball, the Crux. Today we have three professionals facing off against three very skilled amateur bowlers. I'm Mike Flanagan, and joining me today on this Storm Live webcast is the voice of the PBA Tour, and he's a PBA Hall of Famer, Randy Peterson. Mike, thanks very much. It's always a pleasure to work with you, something I look forward to all the time. But you know what I'm really looking forward to? Talking about this exciting brand new bowling ball, the Crux. And what better place to showcase this brand new bowling ball than the beautiful Kegel training facility? And we're going to do it, did I mention, on three completely different oil patterns today. That's right. 38 feet, 42 feet, and 44 feet is what the players will be bowling on today. Now let's introduce today's lineup. For the pros, the leadoff bowler, the southpaw, Rhino Page. Rhino Page, a three-time winner on the PBA Tour and a former Rookie of the Year. Rhino coming back from significant wrist surgery. He had a bad wrist injury that bothered him for a long time, finally had the surgery, went through rehab, but Rhino Page is back at 100%. And bowling against Rhino Page today, another southpaw, a little bit straighter look and a little bit older, but don't count him out. His name is Lenny Biondi. Well, Lenny Biondi is very familiar to anybody living in the Central Florida area. He's got a high series of 858, and he's won a senior PBA Regionals doubles title as well. Bowling behind Lenny today in the two-hole for the amateurs, none other than Todd Minotti. And, Randy, I believe you have a little history with Todd. You know him very well. I used to bowl against Todd Minotti on tour way back in the day. I won't tell you how long ago. But Todd Minotti was elected to the Orlando USBC Hall of Fame in 2011. He's bowled two 300s in the USBC Open Championships. Todd Minotti knows how to bowl. He knows how to bowl, but I know there's one person he's never bowled against, and that's Norm Duke. He's got a tough feat today bowling against arguably the greatest bowler of all time. Norm Duke is in my top four of greatest players in the history of the PBA. 37 titles. The, and also, the Wee Iceman, well, he's made just a little over $3 million in his career. And anchoring for the pro squad, Chris Loeschetter from Ohio. 
And after nine years and 154 tournaments, Lowshedder finally broke into the winner's circle, winning the Lucas Oil Wolf Open in Milwaukee back in the 2012-13 season. Oh, and by the way, he did it using a Storm IQ Tour. And finishing it out for the amateurs, the anchor bowler, the youngest person we have, young Sean Wilcox. A lot of fun to watch Sean Wilcox, real high backswing, lots of power for only being 16 years of age, and he's also a member of Junior Team USA. So there you have it, folks. We've got some great bowling in store for you this afternoon, and we'll be back in just a little bit to call all the action. Now back to the Storm headquarters. Well, Vic, that's some interesting stuff there at Kegel. I mean, that's uh, a lot of great players, a lot of great action. We'll be curious to see uh, if we go back to that and see what's going on later on in, in the webcast. But right now, Vic, Catalyst Core. I mean, a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of energy. I mean, there's some rumors floating around that this possibly could be maybe ball of the year, asymmetrical ball of the year. Who knows? Give me a little bit of what, uh, what went into that. Thanks, Hank. Well, I have to say that introduction video where we talked about uh, the creation, and it, it was very interesting when they had me driving through the canyon because uh, one of our directors here asked, well, what was the inspiration? You know, how, how did you get the concept? And I, I told him the actual story of I was driving home. You know, I, I moved here from Washington. It's about a nine-hour drive, and, you know, I get to drive through some beautiful mountains up through uh, Idaho, Panhandle, and Montana, and all that back to Washington. And while I was driving through the mountains, you know, a nine-hour drive, you, you get some time to think. And I just started thinking about these weight block designs because some of the, the items that I'd seen before I came to Storm, you know, I was in the pro shop, and some of the things that uh, you personally designed even uh, gave me some inspiration as far as RG planes and how exactly those work. So as I was driving, I started thinking about the shape, and it just inspired by the mountains. What can I say? The whole the concept of driving through it. So when we filmed that, it was actually pretty cool because that's literally how it happened is driving through the mountains, beautiful view, and it just came to me that the idea of keeping a, a nice, simple, asymmetrical design, you know, the ovals, we've, we've had success with some very simple designs that are very powerful down the lane, but how could we push it a little bit further? And then, you know, of course, after I came here and we started pushing weight block technology even further, that's where uh, this idea of having this cavity cut into it, and then a, a pseudo cavity inside of it, another double cavity, really pushed it even further. And you know, luckily with the rendering software we have here, the the Creo software, we're able to create these shapes. And you know, before I had to carve it out, and a lot of trial and error. And I, I think I saw some wood figures that were cut some years ago, and some clay figures. And you know, now we can do it all uh, through the computer. And once we took the look at those shapes, it was, it was really impressive the type of RG planes and paths that we could create. But more importantly, it allowed us to do something that once in a while we've struggled with. And I, I'm sure you can explain some of the ideas you've had. Just trying to manufacture mm -hmm. them is, has not always been the easiest thing to do. Well, now with the software, we can actually manufacture it a lot easier and keep it in line because we have to make sure that the truest low RG of the ball stays to the pin. It's got to be very accurate. It's, you know, for drilling, for layout purposes, for tracking purposes. So with this dual cavity and the way it's, you know, it's not an asymmetric, the way you typically see it where the two sides mirror each other, it's a rounded sphere on one side, elliptical rather, and then you have the cavity on, on the other side. Well, that could actually cause it to be off pin or off spot a little mm -hmm. bit. But with the software that we have and this creation, we're actually able to tip it and create it and balance it so that it's still truly pinned along the x-axis. But now all of a sudden, these RG planes are shifted quite a bit. So to visualize that, we actually uh, did a little bit of graphics. And we have another video clip that I'd like to cut to that should help uh, explain exactly what I'm talking about here. Here we have the Crux Bowling Ball featuring the very dynamic Catalyst weight block. And what makes the Catalyst so unique are these RG bands. Imagine each one of the colors represented here represents a different RG value. So these colors are very, very important to us, especially the green band, which makes it so unique. That's typically your three to four inch type layouts. And then even if we expand that into the two to five inch region, you'll notice that those colors are very, very elongated from each side of the bowling ball. Now what elongated planes mean to the bowler is when their layouts are on that particular plane or path, it gives us a very strong dynamic motion. 
Now, what's unique about it is typically an asymmetrical has very, very sharp angles or sharp corners. It means that you can get some very unique ball motion down lane, but sometimes live by the sword, die by the sword is kind of the saying. So those really sharp planes, sometimes those can actually penalize you. Whereas in this particular shape, everything being so long and very, very straight, it just gives us a very controllable, predictable motion. In this particular image, you can see how each of the planes represents the weight block and its given layouts. The PSA, where the lightning bolt would be, is going to be the center black dot in this particular picture. So notice that even when we get into this six inch region, even the typically sharp and very, very strong PSA bands are still very, very long and they've been lengthened out. So overall, the uniqueness of this weight block is in the fact that it's controllability. You can pick your favorite layout, you can pick a range of layouts, and they're all going to react very, very consistently for you from the very front of the ball path to the very end of it. So what we're going to see here with these elongated planes are constant continuous motion, something that's ideal for ball reaction. All right, great video on RG planes. And you know, we've been working on RG planes and, the, and talking about design with RG planes for a couple of years. I mean, we've had a couple of pieces on the rotor grip side that have really worked on trying to manipulate the RG planes, trying to create the axis going in the right direction and, and maintaining it longer. So great video. Um, but, you know, there's some other factors that we have to consider, too. So, I mean, what else in terms of RG planes? But we need to really understand RG. Yeah, RG is a, a very interesting concept because it's really, you know, up until we started playing with the planes themselves, we only focused on three spots on a bowling ball, and that was it. Yeah, it was only I mean, X, Y, and Z, and that was it. So, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about RG, but we're going to have Marshall Kent help us here. So let's take a look at that. Today we're uh, here with Marshall Kent. He's going to be demonstrating for us the magic of RG and how it relates to a bowling ball. So right now I have him on a physics turntable. This is going to allow him to rotate very easily with very little friction. So this is great because it's like a bowling ball rolling in motion. So what we want to do is demonstrate if I put so much energy into rotating him, so my release, my RPMs, if I give him a nice little turn, he's spinning very freely. So this is like a bowling ball released off your hand. Now, right now, he's in what you'd consider a high RG orientation. He's got these weights. They're way out. So he's going relatively slow. Now, what happens if we make him a low RG object? I didn't touch him. So now, Marshall, go ahead and lower the weights. Notice how much faster he's spinning now. The reason he's spinning faster is because all of the mass is now centered towards what would be the x-axis, or this is the pin. So when the mass is towards the center, it's very easy for him to rotate rapidly. When the mass is out, Notice how much slower he spins. So this is the magic of picking the right RG for a bowling ball, is determining do we want a high RG type rotation, or do we want a low RG type rotation. So once again, great video. Another great video in terms of explaining RG, so that everybody can really understand it. Where we're not getting too technical, and a lot of good imagery. So once again, thanks Vic. Thanks, Hank. Uh, I actually wanted to put a thanks out there to Weber Campus and the physics department and the bowling team there. Uh, they opened up the lanes for us, and then they also got us the, the area where you saw it filmed at. And it was really neat. We actually had some of the physics kids there, and we also had some of the, the bowling kids there, and they all were cheering as we started spinning our professionals on the turntables. So we've got a couple more things I want to show you a little bit later. Well, that's great, Vic. So for, we talked about RG. We're going to talk about a few others as we go, but let's cut back to Florida now. Let's go see what's going on at the Kegel Training Center. Here we are back at Lake Wales, Florida at the Kegel Training Facility. Storm, Crux, Amateur versus the Pros. Tenth frame, Rhino Page will be up first in the tenth frame on this 38-foot modified sport pattern, Randy. Rhino Page looking really solid in this opening game. Only missing in the sixth frame when he went eight spare. Everything else has been Nothing but strikes for Rhino Page. Rhino's always liked asymmetrical balls by Storm, but he told me that he really thought this ball was going to be a winner. And just got that a touch inside, leaving the six pin. Yeah, you're right, Mike. He really likes asymmetrical stuff, and uh, he's making the crux look pretty good here early on on a very tough flat oil pattern. And now here's Lenny Biondi. Lenny still with 235 left. He's making this ball look pretty good too from a little bit straighter angle. Gets the 
ball inside of target. Oh, what a break for Lenny. How about that pin carry? Chips the 6-8 out. Ronald Page is like, hey, what about me? Yeah, he's going to just sit down and talk to Norm for a little bit as Lenny got the great carry there. Take a look at our three pros. Norm, Loesch, and Rhino. And our Ams. Look at Wilcox tapping his leg. He's got to be excited bowling in this thing today. Right now he's trying to keep the insides coming to the outside. Now Lenny a little bit high. Not a good shot from Lenny. Fortunate just to leave the 2-4. But and how about this game for him, though? I mean, 223 on a flat pattern when you're 63 years of age going up against a guy like Rhino Page. Pretty solid. Rhino switching to a spare ball. Covers it. Still has 257 left. Pretty good start here on a 2 to 1 ratio, 38 feet, which normally you wouldn't see a ball like this match up on. Nice conversion there by Lenny Biondi. 223. Good start. Lenny, uh, you know, he's he's trying to show the guys he still has some game left. Now Rhino after coming in just a little high sure he's going to make just a slight move and maybe try to open up this oil pattern a little bit. A little bit further out, covers nicely. And what a nice start for Rhino Page. 257 on this flat oil pattern. Pretty impressive. Todd Minotti, first shot here in the 10th frame. Todd's been bowling pretty well. Did I mention that I used to bowl against Todd on tour? Nice trip four there. That was a really good shot by Todd. Did I ever tell you that I went to his house for a barbecue once? No, was the food good? It was, it was really good. Now here's Duke in a pretty close match against Todd. Todd Minotti can double, or excuse me, strike out the 10th grade and get to 217. Norm Duke could have struck out to shoot 226. Instead, another wrap for Norm Duke. Now Todd Minotti stepping up here, can throw a double to get in the two teens. It's like a little bit inside a target. Yeah, and on a flat pattern, that's no, that's no bueno. Now Duke throwing cross lane, not switching balls. Duke is great at flattening his hand, keeping it end over end, and when your arm swing is that good, it's like kind of like a rudder on a ship. He can direct that bowling ball in any direction he wants. So Norm can still shoot 215. Todd with the spare is going to bowl 207. So Norm is going to beat Todd Minotti this first game. Little area check, maybe? It looks like he moved in, tried to open it up a little bit, and Norm looks a little confused, but I think Norm's going to take that victory. A W is a W, no matter which way you look at it. Now, Low Shutter's going to let Wilcox step up in a 10th frame first. Wilcox can still bowl 246. Low Shutter this game has been struggling a little bit, but he is clean through nine frames. Take a look at this form right here, Sean Wilcox. This kid leaves nothing in the bag. Pretty impressive young, young player there. A lot of hand, a lot of revs, a lot of speed. Low shutter didn't like that shot. Looked like it fell off his hand. He looked like he slipped when he got to the foul line. That ball almost went in the right channel. I think Low shutter is. Uh, Pretty excited about the fact that he got six with that shot. Wilcox has got to be feeling pretty good. He's going to put a whooping on Chris Lowshed, or maybe even as many as 60 pins. Oh, what a break. Yeah, and there's that sport pattern. You get it inside, there's no forgiveness, and what a huge break that is. Sean Wilcox will be in the 240s now. Low shutter covers it up, still has 184. 
So to recap, Rhino Page 257, Norm Duke 214, Loesch can bowl 184. They can get to 655. And for the amateurs, Lenny Biondi 223, Tabanati 207. And now Wilcox can fill it up for 246. And he does. So it's 676. The amateurs are going to beat the pros, Randy. Yeah, Mike, and I'm a little surprised at that given the fact that this is a very flat oil pattern. So Loeschetter is going to fill it up. Strike for Chris Loeschetter. Let's send it back to Storm Headquarters. We'll be back with you with game number two coming up. 676, 655. Wow, amateurs beat the pros. I know we have some great pros down there, but sounds like we got some really good amateurs down there. And 676, uh, obviously that new ball looks pretty good down there. Yeah, I got to tell you, I was really impressed how well it rolled. We, uh, you know, when we chose the patterns, one of the interesting things about it was we designed this ball, of course, to be a big oil ball. It's designed for heavier patterns, but, you know, one of the things that we lose frequently is versatility. That's why I wanted to show what this ball was able to accomplish on what ended up being a 38-foot shorter, flatter pattern. And those amateurs, you know, they really made it look good down there, especially that Sean Wilcox. Uh, what are the rules on offering contracts? That yeah, age? we got to kind of stay away from that offering those uh, contracts yet. Well, as he grows older, we'll, we'll think about that later. But there's a lot of key elements in bowling ball design. We talked about RG. We talked about the RG planes. But there's a couple other good key factors. We talk about differential. Is the next big thing we always look at is how much differential do we need or how much flare are we looking for in a bowling ball? So I know that sometimes people get a little confused or curious about what does really differential mean? So I think we have a, another look at it right here, so let's take it away. To show differential, we have Mike Fagan on the turntable this time. So we're going to set Mike in motion just like we did with Marshall. And now we can see he has one arm out. So this is the idea of differential. It is literally the difference from one axis of the bowling ball to the other. So we have the high axis, which is his arm out with the weight. And then we have the low axis, which is where he has the weight at his side. So for a bowling ball to get differential, we create an imbalance. So right now he's what I call a high orientation. Now let's see what happens when he goes to a medium orientation. It's a little bit slower. Now go ahead and show us the imbalance as one side changes to the other, like a bowling ball would be wobbling, for example. Keep going. So notice we can control how fast he rotates and how much imbalance there is just by the position of the weight, how far it is away from his body. So if we wanted a really lower stable bowling ball, we would have both of the weights at his side. That's the low RG orientation, so it's very neutral, not a lot of imbalance. If we have him raise the one arm out to a high RG, now all of a sudden we get a lot of imbalance. So in this particular case, this is a good example of showing us how we get differential in a bowling ball, is instead of both weights out or both weights in, we create an imbalance in the ball itself. This creates wobble, and as, as we can see by Mike Fagan's turning here, he's definitely out of balance. Good job, Mike. All right, thanks. <laughs> so if Mike Fagan were a bowling ball, right now we'd say that there's too much differential and we probably need to take it down a notch. Just glad I didn't eat lunch first. Wow. Uh, Fagan, I hope he's okay after that. That looked uh, pretty painful there. Yeah, I can tell you. Uh... Mike, after we did that, we had to do uh, two takes on that particular one, and by take two, I was looking for a bucket because he, was, <laughs> he wasn't holding up very well on that turntable, Hank. Well, the second, you know, a second component of what we talked about, first of all, was RG, second's differential. So a 250 RG and a 50 differential bowling ball. So we've got those two aspects that we really look for in design. So the mid, RG, you know, mid to lower RG and the higher differential. So still gave us a little bit of float through the front in the 38-foot pattern, gave us a nice motion down the lane. So got some good scores out of it. But there's one more key component that we always seem to, we're always looking for is that preferred spin axis or the PSA. Yeah, absolutely, Hank. And, you know, that's one of the things is we've been working with the PSA for quite a while. But, you know, some of the first introductions of PSA balls was a little bit before my tenure here. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, this goes back to a little bit before my tenure, but I was on early in this whole campaign. Is I mean, if you guys remember El Nino and we did the split density bowling balls and those back to the day of 1998. So those were the first ones that were, we kind of 
made the bowling world take a, a really good look at us. And so the split density, we moved forward and we went to a disk technology where we used those in X factors and dominations where the outside component was symmetrical, but the inside component was two disks that created a real strong asymmetry. And all through that, we were using symmetrical parts, but we were using either half, cut, half pores or disk to try to create asymmetry, which was giving us really unique ball motion in the industry, making other people's kind of other you know, manufacturers take a good look at us. And then we started to mess a little bit more with true shapes and asymmetry in the shapes themselves. And you know, we got into a, the shape locks and the shape lock HDs. And I mean, the shape lock HD was the most successful, probably asymmetric ball we've ever made, which was virtual gravity and virtual gravity nanos. And then we you know, transcend a little bit farther into G2, which was the strongest ball we've ever made in terms of low RG, high diff, extremely strong PSA. So you know, we know the catalyst core is not the super, you know, as far as the huge numbers when it comes to those PSAs and differentials, but wow, is it unique. And, and we're going to learn some more about the uniqueness of that PSA and, and, and how we get to that number. To explain the difference between a symmetrical ball and an asymmetrical ball, we have Randy Peterson on the turntable this time. So what we're going to do is we have essentially a symmetrical object. There's really no difference left to right, top to bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to get it spinning, and then we're going to ask Randy to rotate his arms and see what happens. So 15 pound ball, get it spinning fairly fast. Go ahead and move it, Randy. Again. Yeah, nothing really happened. So that's because everything's balanced. So as he's rotating it, there's really no force that's causing Randy to rotate at all. So that's a symmetrical ball. Now, what we want to experiment with is to show the power of asymmetry. So for this, we have an asymmetric object. All right? Just so this time, either way. So this time, we have an asymmetrical object because obviously we can see as it's rotating around one direction, we have a lot of mass out here. But if we rotated it this way, the mass is relatively centered. So this is an asymmetric object. So what we're going to do is we're going to get it spinning just like we did with the bowling ball. Go ahead and rotate your arms a little bit, Randy. More. So the idea here is, is the, the wheel is moving, or in this case, the asymmetry of the bowling ball, it's actually causing enough force to rotate Randy on this turntable. So that's the key difference between a symmetrical and an asymmetric, is on a symmetrical bowling ball, when it starts rotating, there's really no great force that's going to try and cause it to reorientate itself. Whereas the asymmetrical, shown by this bicycle wheel, has enough force to it to actually cause Randy to rotate on the turntable. This is fun. Let's get you really rotating here. Ready? Oh, great. 90 I degrees. I was hoping you'd say that. 90 degrees? 90 degrees. Whee! <laughs> 90 the other way. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Look at me, I'm flying. <laughs> <laughs> and stabilize yourself. Once again, great video, nice visual aid. We had the bicycle wheel as we were turning it, we were bringing it back, straightening out that pattern, understanding PSA. So we have RG, differential PSA. PSA kind of lining up in the direction of travel. We can adjust that PSA to give us enhanced motion. We can get it more arc early, later. It's that fine tuning agent that's very, very important in asymmetry. So I, I guess we got some other things that we're gonna look forward here. And that second game down at Kegel, yeah, I got to tell you about that one, Hank, is, you know, this is really more what we designed the bowling ball for itself is a little bit heavier oil, more like what you'd find typically at probably your own home center is 42 foot, a little bit more volume. It's not quite as difficult. You know, it's in between what you'd call a house condition and what you'd call a sport pattern. Uh, Kegel likes to call it a challenge pattern as it would be. So 42 foot, a little bit more length. Let's see how they're doing down there. Mike and Randy back with you here from Kegel Training Center. Game number two, a little bit longer oil pattern here, 42 feet. Lenny Biondi up in the 10th frame. Lenny threw five out of the first seven strikes, opened in the eighth and the ninth, and now Lenny can only bowl 195 if he spares strikes. Rhino Page, however, a little different story. Rhino Page can strike out for 260. 
260 for Rhino Page. He has been lighting it up down here. Yeah, you think maybe they should have rethought the order? Maybe Rhino <laughs> going, going in the anchor position? Just saying. Looks good off his hand again. Oh, no. Oh, what a bad break for Rhino. A blower 7-10. The amateurs had to like that. That keeps him in the ballpark in terms of scores for this game. Rhino Page could have really put a hurting on Lenny Biondi. That 260 would have been almost a 70-pin advantage. Lenny Biondi only shooting 194 now. The best Rhino Page can shoot with nine out, 226. Remember, the 7-10 split's only been made three times in the history of television. He chucked it at it, uh, couldn't get it to bounce. So Rhino, the first game, bowled 257, and he had 260 left, and bad break. 226 is his final score. Now Lenny looking to try to bowl 195. Lenny's been around the pocket all game, though. It's just the eighth and the ninth frames creeping in high. A couple of bad shots cost Lenny. So 194. And now we get a look at Stormin' Norman Duke. Norm can still shoot 247. Remember his first game, 214. Didn't have very good pin carry. A little bit different story on this longer oil pattern. How much longer do you think the 50-year-old Norm Duke can continue to throw 16-pound equipment? I don't know, and he doesn't use inserts either. Nope. That 16 pounds takes a toll on your body after all. I, I went back to 16 for about three or four years, and now I'm throwing 15 now, and it's a, it's a little bit more doable. Now here's Todd Minotti. Todd can bowl strike out here in the 10th frame for 224. Todd has a good look to the pocket. Look at that ball drive through the pins. Yeah, he's he's uh, he's got a nice line. He's thrown a lot of strikes this game. He had an open frame in the third, and everything else has been pretty much in the pocket. While everyone's been watching the webcast, we've been watching these guys bowl. And several of them have come up to us to tell us how impressed they are with this bowling ball, now seeing it on two different bowling patterns. Six completely different and unique styles of bowlers and different oil patterns. Boy, you really get a great perspective of just how well this ball rolls. Now a light hit for Todd, and notice how low the pins stayed on the deck. Very important when trying to figure out your pin carry as the ball faces into the pin deck. Oh, look at the expression from Norm. Where did that messenger come from? I think he paid the mechanic in the back. I think he did too. Let's, uh, let's take another look at it here. You know, the one thing that's really impressed me thus far is the pin carry. And not just because of that. You mentioned Todd Minotti's hit earlier. I mean, there's been really good pin carry. Pins just flying everywhere. Todd Minotti ripped the rack, the last shot, keeping the pins nice and low on the deck. This is a little bit wide. He's going to finish with 224. So it's 247 for Duke, 224 for Minotti. Norm's just got Todd's number through two games. Now, how about low shedder this game? Completely different story for Loesch. He's got 280 left after bowling just 184, a clean 184 the first game. He, he could almost get to the Century Award. 184 clean, really struggled on the flat pattern. Had a couple of more feet and a little bit more volume in the middle, and all of a sudden Chris Loeschetter is going at a 280 pace. He told both of us in between the two games, too, that he was just a little tight during game number one. Feels much more comfortable a little bit later here in the day. Really is liking what he's seeing out of this crux. Look how hard that ball gets through the pins. Now, we got a little different story here this game for Sean Wilcox. First game, he shoots 246. Right now, Sean struggling to shoot 170. Well, that was a good looking shot there for the camera, I guess. All the folks on the webinar, I, I guess Sean knew we were gonna be showing that shot, but Sean has struggled today, just not in the right part of the lane during this second game, 42 foot. It's got him a little bit puzzled. 
I don't think he ever moved far enough right and went straight enough. Low shutter having no problems at all. Oh, no messenger, no 280 for Chris Lowshedder, but I think he'll take 279. Yeah, especially after that opening 184 queen, Loesch is back. I think that's why they have him anchor. I think they knew what they were doing today. Wilcox coming in light. Another good shot, though. Two good shots here in the 10th frame for Sean. He got himself a little bit better spot there. He's got to be happy with how he finished this game. I don't know if he's going over and asking Low Shutter for advice or if he's just kind of saying, all right, we've got one more game. I think he just told him, hey, I got a little more hand than you, pal. 44 feet is on deck. Wilcox, actually a great kid. Just really happy to be here bowling with these pros and be invited to be part of this. So there you have it. It's 585 for the amateurs, 752 for the pros. Let's send it back to Storm headquarters. When we come back, 44 feet up next. Wow, I've got to tell you, Hank, uh, I wasn't expecting that out of Sean Wilcox. You know, he made that 38-foot sport pattern look pretty easy. And then he comes back to a 42-foot pattern, a little bit easier, more volume. Uh, he, mu he definitely must have read the lanes wrong or something along those lines because, uh, you know, low shatter, he definitely figured it out. I mean, 280, a couple taps there, he could have easily ran it all the way. So really interesting to see that transition, but that's exactly what we were looking for. You know, it's a heavier oil, a little bit more uh, volume out there, and numbers started to shine. Yeah, I mean, uh, even in that second game, uh, they still averaged 222. I, I know that the pros just jumped out to like a 146-pin lead. So very interesting stuff there. You know, the 42-foot pattern, I think the rev rates of the pros started to catch up to the rev rates of the amateurs. And even though Wilcox, lost, he might have lost that one shot there, still, I mean, this next one coming could be interesting. But, you know, enough of that. Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit more about cover stock because we've talked about the key components of the bowling ball and the weight block itself and the catalyst. But let's really talk about the tire that touches the road because that really, it's, the, you know, kind of the crowning touch. And what Storm's really become famous for is, is our, our, our cover stocks. I mean, if we go all the way back into the reactor series and into this, this, you know, enhanced, uh, this evolution reactive genesis. And so the NRG was before that. And the NRG was the predecessor because we took that ERG cover stock, which was the purest cover stock we'd made to date. We added a nano additive that created those folds and that created those nice topography to the cover stock. So it gave us something very unique and different. And the nano was one of the most successful balls we've ever made, one of the most hooking balls we've ever made, because first of all, we had a great core in it with the Shape Block HD, and then we had that enhanced cover. So let's fast forward a little bit. Let's ERG by itself. Let's take the Nano out of it. That cover stock alone is one of the most aggressive we've ever made. Tremendous peaks and valleys, tremendous folding throughout the cover stock to give us that subsurface texture and topography, which we need some. We need that for oil displacement, because that's how we create surface friction with the lane is we have to have some place to displace the oil. So if we create those big peaks and valleys, that oil can get down into the bottom, we can get that traction in the lane. So let's learn a little bit more about those cover stocks. We chose the ERG because we were really looking to match up the weight block shape and the dynamics that, that, that comes with that shape with that catalyst core. And when we do testing, we test a multitude of cover stock variations. Again, we're looking at oil displacement. So we're trying to find the right balance for a cover stock. We're definitely looking for higher porosity. We're looking for something that's going to be able to absorb and displace and handle a lot of oil. And this is achieved through the microchasms, through that spacing or through those capsules you'll actually see the oil be displaced. And then as far as folding goes, if you look for example at, at the shifting of the plates, tectonic plates in the, in the earth, and we're looking at, you know, are we looking at a central part of the, the, the Great Plains portion of the U.S., for example, or are we looking at the Rocky Mountains? You know, you're looking at extreme differences here. And when you're looking for a ball for heavy oil and maximum performance, think Rocky Mountains. And that's what you get here when you're looking at this. And again, we have to balance it all to make sure we don't have too steep a cliffs or we don't have too massive of valleys. Again, balancing is the important key part here in the equation. And we take it very seriously at Storm. We don't just throw cover stock 
X or cover stock Y on a ball and say, let's go with it. We evaluate it for performance. We balance it and compare it with the type of core that we select and put in that bowling ball. And then take a look at the type of bowlers we're trying to fit. And then take a look at the type of lane conditions we're trying to adapt or, or mold this bowling ball to. And that's why you, when you see the crux and you see the ERG cover stock and the catalyst core, you see it all put together on the lane, you're going to be amazed. So another great video, once again, explaining to you at home What's going on in that cover stock? We've talked RG, we talked differential, we've talked PSA, talked about the tire that touches the road and cover stock. So lots of good stuff there, Vic. Yeah, I got to tell you, Hank, it's, we spend a lot of time on cover stocks because that is such a valuable part of ball reaction. Uh, when I first started here, actually, we used this device called a profilometer, and that's where you drag this little needle across the surface of the ball, and you do that a few hundred thousand times, you start to really appreciate the graphics and animation because a single line when it's on the printout just doesn't show you how valuable the information we gather from it is. And that's where taking some uh, 3D images that we've got from 3D scans and atomic force microscopy, you know, a few different techniques to really show the cover stock strengths. Uh, I got to tell you, there's a lot of love and uh, TLC that goes into the development of a cover stock. And I think with this ERG cover stock, Oh uh, man, I got to tell you, I think we've got a home run, and we really did see it on that 42-foot pattern, especially the way the numbers started to go up. So it was really impressive. Well, Vic, good stuff, but you know what? We're going to add two more feet to that pattern, and we're going to see what how these uh, pros fare against the Joes. Oh, I'm sorry, amateurs against the pros. So let's send it back down to Randy and Mike, the Kegel. Welcome back to the Kegel Training Facility. Mike Flanagan, Randy Peterson here with you. And Lenny Biondi is up in the 10th frame of this third game. Lenny Biondi can still shoot 248, 248. Wow, man, that ball's looking great on 44 feet, Randy. Will Cox is just finishing up his ninth frame, and that's only the second time he is not struck. He still has 269 left. And Lenny Biondi, as I said before, Randy, 248 for him if he can strike out with two balls left. 44 foot house pattern. Lenny Biondi really proving to a lot of people that he still has game. You can see the concentration of oil as that ball just kind of holds its line going into the pocket. Lenny Biondi with one more strike, she's 248. That'll give him 665 for the three games on the three different oil patterns. Now Rhino Page. Stepping up, big story here, Mike. Rhino Page, Randy, nine in a row, looking for 10 in a row. This could be the first perfect game, dare I say it, with the Crux. Oh, did you jinx him? 10 back right there, Randy. And we've been watching this, while well, everyone's been watching the webinar today, we've been watching Rhino Page just saw off strike after strike after strike. Lenny Biondi, his last ball, can still shoot a really nice, as we said, 248. And you see three different kind of pocket hits there, and all three carry with this crux. Lenny today finishes with 665, and if Rhino Page can go the distance for 300, he will shoot 783. And remember, he had a bad break with that 710 that we saw in the second game. Rhino Page could be very easily looking at a nice 800 series, but now... It's the 11th ball here, bidding for perfection. Oh, what do you call that, Randy? Well, that was a messenger with a little help because the head pin came flying across and then something else was leaning on the seven pin in the left channel. Rhino Page destroyed that rack. I think Rhino's feeling it a little bit. You know, we called him in to be part of this webcast today especially for all of our distributors and pro shops watching. And I know Rhino wants to go the distance here. I know he's, he would like to bowl 300. Uh, he's been a big fan, as we mentioned earlier, of the asymmetrical balls that we've come out with over on the left side of the lane. He's excited about this ball, and now he's got a chance to prove just how good it is. He can bowl 300 today, and I promise you, this is real life, folks. He did it. 300, Randy. What a great game. Great shot there in that 12th and final shot for three bills. It just doesn't get any better. Great job by Rhino Page. So Rhino finishes out with 783. He's your professional. 
And your amateur bowler, Lenny, finishes with 665. Pretty good from the left side. Todd Minotti working on a strike in the ninth. There's another one. See that six go to the sidewall and cut the 10 out? Man, that's what you look for in a bowling ball that's going through the pins the right way. Todd Minotti now has a chance for a possible 248. Now Norm Duke up can still shoot a score in the 220s, 225 to be exact. Good looking shot, bad result. Yeah, Norm's had a little bit of carry issue today. He told me that he really liked his shot shape to the pocket. Todd Minotti. Very impressive ball roll through the pins. Time to pay the debt. Norm digging into his pocket. But Todd Minotti's a gentleman. He does not accept. Todd can still bowl with his fill ball, 679. Norm Duke It's going to be in the 660s. Something that Todd Minotti can put on his resume now. I beat Norm Duke for three games at the Kegel Training Center with a crux. So 248 for Todd Minotti. He bowls 679 over three different oil patterns today. Norm Duke can fill it up. Tenth frame. Norm bowls 666. I think I would have tried to have gotten nine on that shot if I was Norm. Just saying. Now Sean Wilcox can still bowl 269 as we mentioned. He's really got it going on this game. Wow, look at that bowling ball back end. That thing looked like somebody kicked it left. And this roller coaster epic battle against Chris Loeschetter is coming down to the 10th frame. Chris didn't like his footwork there, but still got a strike. Chris can strike out for 225. Second shot in the 10th for Wilcox. This kid earned his way on the Junior Team USA, and we see why here today. He's got a great game. Great future ahead of that young man. So Sean can fill it up for 682. Low Shutter needs a strike here, otherwise Wilcox is going to snap him off, and he does. Holy cow. Sean Wilcox is going to beat Chris Low Shutter today. Chris can only shoot 678. Surprising that Norm and Chris Lowshedder could only muster 205 and 210 respectively on the house pattern. Rhino Page, 300. Nice pin carry there, huh? There you have it, folks. Chris Lowshedder finishes with 215. Sean Wilcox, 269. Today we had excellent results from the Crux with the bowlers averaging 230. This new technology certainly lives up to expectations. Special thanks to our participants today and Ralph Solon, Storm Southeast sales manager for working behind the scenes, putting everything together. And to everyone here at the Kegel Training Center, thanks for your hospitality. For Randy Peterson, I'm Mike Flanagan. Thank you for watching today. And congratulations again to Rhino Page on bowling the first 300 with the Crux. Wow, some impressive numbers down there at Kegel. I mean, two shots to get lined up on the pattern, an extra two feet, and we saw that, I mean, Ronald Page shot 300. That is just amazing. I think they averaged 230 or something like that. That was uh, some impressive scores. Yeah, that was uh, definitely some impressive bowling there. I've got to tell you, watching it on a 44-foot pattern, uh, that was a little bit of a nail-biter when we asked the guys at Kegel, can you put a heavy volume 44-footer out? <laughs> just wondering what the scores were going to turn out to be, and... Rhino did not disappoint, but the scores by everybody, I mean, especially the amateurs, 248, 248, I mean, they lit it up as well, so pretty impressive bowling there. Yeah, Sean shot 260, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, Low Shedder still shot 210, I think Norm shot 20, it's, you guys saw it there in the video, but man, that's still some impressive stuff. Yeah, you know, Hank, uh, we actually recorded every single shot of that, uh, 
I'd be interested if there was enough feedback for it. What do you think? Do you think we could toss it out there? Sure. You know what? Viewers at home, I really want you to reach out to us. Let us know. Give us your feedback if you really like to have that whole match on TV. Because you really all you saw was the 10 frames of each of those matches. And you kind of got to see where they were playing. But the nice thing would be to see the breakdown from the start to the finish. So if we get enough good positive feedback, we'll compile all that together. We'll get it up on our Storm Bowling YouTube page. And you know what? If you got some time, a bucket of popcorn, it's a great watch. It's nice to see some really good you know, bowling, some transitions that we saw from the amateurs to the pros, and in the end, a really good 300 game. We've seen some tremendous stuff today. In fact, we've seen a 38-foot pattern. We've seen a 42-foot pattern. We've even seen a 44-foot flood, and that ball performed. Uh, actually, the heavier the volume got, the better and better the scores were. So I've got to tell you, that definitely proves that this is a heavy oil ball, that this was designed to get into a true role. But being a uh, part of the R&D of development process, you always want to test and make sure that when you make claims that it's a, it's a heavy oil ball, you want to make sure that you've done your due diligence, so to speak. So there's a video that we've prepared that definitely puts this ball to the test. Let's <laughs> yeah. go ahead and cut to that.
Wow, Vic, that lane's a lot cleaner than uh, what we saw in that video. I got to tell you, Hank, it was a lot easier cleaning the lane than it was the ceiling, but the, <laughs> that's a different story there. You know, I had a lot of fun today, had a lot of really good things. I went through some pretty cool stuff, and I, I got to tell you, this was a very interesting webcast. Things We showed quite a bit today. Well, once again, Vic, um, Storm Products is always appreciative of the support we get from the consumers. We're always trying to push the envelope to that next level, and... And we can't thank you enough for all your support. We wanted to bring you some great information today. And I think the way we delivered it was really unique. And if we get great feedback from the consumers, from the pro shops, we will continue to do this type of basically reporting to you and, and kind of giving you another way to see some great products. So once again, thanks for all the support. Can't thank you enough for what you've done and to bring Storm to where it is today. And we do have a closing message today from the president of our company. Mr. Dave Sims. This is a great technological advancement in bowling balls. Um, the way that the core is designed, wrapped by the cover, uh, we've done our homework on the, on the new crux. Our job at Storm is to make sure that if you choose a Storm bowling ball, that when you step on the lanes, that you feel like you have the best chance to win, the best chance to knock down the most pins on every ball. We're the bowlers company. We're bowlers serving bowlers. I mean, nobody understands the sport better than someone who, who plays it and lives it. And everyone here loves bowling and has been active in the bowling game. It, it's a love that we have. It's a passion that we have. And when you put passionate people and great products together, there's no reason to look anywhere else other than to storm.